I have just finished recording the podcast that you are about to listen to, and you are so stinking lucky. I feel so lucky to have just had this conversation and I'm really grateful that it was recorded because as I go back through and edit it, I'm not going to outsource this edit. I'm going to do it myself because there are so many things that Zolita said during this conversation that it was just a sentence here and a sentence there. And as I unpack those sentences, I believe they're going to just absolutely transform my life. And I feel like my life has been transformed just by being in this conversation with Zolita. I have to tell you, I have known of Zolita for many years since I first became a hypnotist about seven years ago. And she lives in my hometown where I grew up, which is Longmont, Colorado. I grew up out in the country outside of Longmont, Colorado. I don't live there anymore. But when I was pulling up at her house to meet her for the first time the other day, I was meeting her along with several other hypnotists. I could feel the magic as I pulled into the property and as I walked into her house and as I met her, it's almost like she just exudes this radiant energy and this, this deep sparkle. And the more she spoke and the more time I got to, to spend in her presence, the more it infused me with my own sense of forward momentum and helped me understand, okay, if Solita can do this, I can do this as well. I think you're going to be completely entranced by this conversation. I encourage you to enjoy it, to take notes, to write down the resources that she mentions, and to just have a magical time as you listen. Hi, Zolita. Hello, Lori. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? Good. So you can feel magic coming into your life. Oh, did you see my Facebook live? (laughs) I did. Yes. Meeting you has had such an impact on my life. I can't tell you just almost from the instant I walked into your house and maybe even the instant I drove onto your property, it's, it's like you can feel an infusion of the essence of you. And I just feel so grateful. Oh, good. Good. I would love to hear more about your book and more about what you're doing there. And then we can go down whatever rabbit trail you want to go down as we move forward. I've done 24 books on hypnosis for hypnosis professionals, which are like PDFs that download. But I decided that this book was kind of like my life's work for the public. You know, we've come under the genre of self-help, but it's like training the public to really let go of the past. The book is Mm -hmm. called Change your mind, change your life, a step-by-step guide to let go of the past. Okay. That's beautiful. And it starts with things like, you know, first step number one, deal with stress, understand what stress is, you know, step number two, eliminate your anxiety, let go of your depression master your weight and other habits. Wow. That's all in the book. Yeah. And then deal with addictions. There are many things people are dealing with that are addictive qualities. And then the last chapter is called from burnout to brilliance. And on the last page of the book, I introduce the fact that I'm going to do an online program called breakthrough to brilliance. It's six weeks long. Once you own the program, you can redo it as many times as you want. Amazing. Yeah. What inspired you to do this? You, it, I think of like Charlotte, what Charlotte's web talking about her magnum opus. And this to me feels like your great work. And so I'm curious what sparked you and where you found the motivation to keep moving until it was finished. Well, when you work with a book editor, you're working in a templated structure to actually create a book that has a Library of Congress number, and that will be published by a publishing house and will be introduced in print-by-demand platforms all over the world simultaneously. So it was much more complicated than the books that I have written on my own. And I learned a lot 
about the process of actually writing, you know, that okay. that it fits in a certain kind of structure if you're going for a publishing house approval. So you had a lot of accountability as well, where, you know, it wasn't, if you didn't finish, it wasn't just you, it was the publisher as well. Yeah. And, and the interesting thing is that, you know, this is the thing I love about coaching. You know, I have coaching clients I've been working with for seven years and they're people that feel like I'm kind of their support person in becoming excellent in their own life. And so there's that element of accountability. Mm -hmm. You know, if we talk about something for you to be setting up to do in your life, and you're going to talk to me again tomorrow afternoon, you're going to do it. Yes. If you're open to having more one-on-one -on -one sessions, would you tell me how that people can reach you for one-on-one -on -one sessions? Absolutely. Okay. So I'm very approachable. My phone number is 303 834-5040. I'm responsive to text messages or phone calls. Text messaging is probably the fastest way to get in touch with me. My email is zoilita at zoilitagrant.net. And I'm super active on Facebook. Okay. You have put my mind at ease. I'm, I'm going to text you now. <laughs> so I don't have to worry about doing the phone call. Yeah, awesome. Texas are very, very easy. Okay. Okay. Be so I'm inspired. I'm inspired to help the world transform. I can feel there's a lot of positive energy coming into the earth, you know, with the Chinese New Year and the Year of the Wood Dragon and all of the potential and the opportunities to bring practical magic back to the earth. I feel really inspired to give tools to the hands of people so that they can improve the quality of their life. That is just beautiful. When you say bring practical magic to the people of the earth, could you just unpack that a little bit? If, you know, if I was, if I was in the first, the fifth grade and I didn't know anything about what practical magic meant, how would you unpack that? Everything is ultimately energy, vibration, and frequency. And when you align your energy and vibration and frequency with the source and the highest intention for your own life, there's a lot of synchronicity that happens. There's a lot of miraculous coincidences where you walk into the right place at the right time, or you meet the right person at the right time in your life. And that brings in these magical abilities to take quantum leaps in growth. Mm -hmm. I feel like my meeting with you and the other ladies. So for everyone listening, I was invited to meet with several hypnotists. They started a Facebook thread and they said, we're all going to meet at Zolita Grant's house. And, and I had known of Zolita for years, but you and I had never met in <laughs> either on the phone or in any context. And as soon as I sat down at her table, I just felt this magical energy that was as if this was what was manifesting in my life for my next step forward. And I have been since the beginning of the year, probably even a few weeks into last year, I have been every morning setting an intention to meet with people who can help me come up higher to meet with people who are like-minded and who are even at the next level so that I can continue to come up higher. And I felt like that meeting for me, it made me think, Oh my gosh, there is some, someone, something in the universe loves me to have orchestrated this event. So I, I have a sense of what you're talking about. Very good. That's really nice yeah. to hear. Zolita. Are, would would you be happy to just share some of your story with us? I sure. You can pretend like you and I have never talked and I don't know your story just for our audience to understand what brought you to where you are today. My story has definitely been a spiritual quest. I was born with extended perceptions. I was born with the ability to feel and sense beings from other planes of reality. 
In fact, the youngest memory I have is being in a crib and having these beings from another dimension become like triangles and squares and circles that had different vibrational sounds. And I would sit in my crib and imagine that I could play these sounds and listen to these different tones. And then, you know, years later, there turns out to be a baby toy that does exactly that in the 20th century. Wow. You know? But that I always had spiritual beings in my life. And so a lot of my life was about learning how to manage my gifts in a way that didn't make me feel crazy. You know, that's why I ended up getting a degree in clinical psychology because I could prove I was not actually crazy. And I was lucky enough to be at a place, Berkeley, California in the 1960s, where there was a lot of the women's movement and the Black Lives movement and the, the psychedelic movement and the consciousness raising movement and the Eastern philosophy movement. And they were all happening simultaneously. And so they had a lot of influence in my life. And I personally got into hypnosis because I weighed 265 pounds at 16. It, it was very sad in my life to have all that weight on my body. And I felt like if I didn't get rid of that weight before I went to college, I'd be stuck in this what I thought of as the fat suit for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. And so my grandmother and I in Berkeley read all of the books that we could from the university library on hypnosis. And we hypnotized me to lose 155 pounds in a year. Wow. And you said it was your grandmother and you that did that together, not having a prior knowledge of hypnosis. No, but my grandmother was pretty mystical. Okay. And just for everyone listening, Zolita, how will you, cause if you're like me, if the listeners like me, they're doing the math in their, in their mind, will you tell us how tall you are or I'm how tall you were? Six, two. Sorry, say I'm, that again. I'm five foot two. Okay. I'm five foot two as well. And I, when I met Zolita, I just, she's just this petite little pixie, just almost it just, you do feel like you have a very magic like presence okay i'm going to be quiet so you can go on with your story wherever you would like to go because of various kinds of circumstances i needed to be able to become an emancipated minor and the only way that i knew how to become an emancipated minor and have charge of my own scholarship i got an amazing scholarship I wanted to go to Berkeley. My mother wanted me to go to Brigham Young University. So I got married at 17. And my husband was in the process of just, you know, discovering his own identity. And he ended up deciding he was gay. And so we were in the Bay Area at that whole time when that movement was beginning too. And so I think that influenced a lot of his choices. I can't imagine having, just dealing with all of that, going from looking for ways to, to move from your family of origin to find a safe place. And then almost it's like having that rug yanked out from underneath you. Well, the interesting thing though, was that I was super into playing therapist. Oh, okay. He was super into playing client. <laughs> and we really liked each other. We'd known each other since kindergarten. Okay. So we had a really nice friendship. And uh, it was interesting because he went to the draft board because it was during the Vietnam War. And he went to the draft board with all these letters from psychiatrists saying various things about him including the fact that he was gay. And the draft board went, okay, when a report in two weeks. Oh, they did? So oh. we went to Canada. Okay. 
We landed in Canada in the summer of 1971 with about 10,000 expatriate Americans. Oh, wow. And the Canadian government was so thrilled because we were educated. You know, the, the immigration policy at that time was very racist, but it's been changed, of course. But it was, you know, you got points for being white, educated, childbearing age, and having skills. What part of Canada did you move into? Vancouver. Okay. It sounds like it was a fairly smooth process. I would imagine it's probably a lot smoother than it would be today. Well, now there's a treaty. Oh. See, there wasn't an extradition treaty between the United States and Canada. So Canada, like, welcomed us with open arms. We had to sneak across the border. Oh. Bruce lay on the floor of a station wagon with a blanket over him. And a teacher from uh, the college at Bellingham took us across the border in the Underground Railroad. Whoa. And I wore this kind of like Mary Tyler Moore hairdo and hat and suit. <laughs> and then we settled in Canada and I went on a vision quest for 18 months. I was very interested in discovering the meaning and purpose of my life because okay. I decided that I could either be crazy or I could be some kind of spiritual adept that was having a spiritual lesson with life and that I wanted to find out what the purpose of that lesson was. Okay. And you're about 17 at this time? I'm about 21 at this time. Oh, okay. And so I decided to go on a vision quest and I decided that my vision quest will be go to the desert and fast and have a vision climb to a mountaintop and meet God, go to the ocean and become purified, and then save a life. Okay. And were you doing most of this on your own? Were you with your husband? Totally by myself. Bruce was becoming super involved in the gay liberation movement and becoming very political about gay rights. And he was a nightclub entertainer that sang and did comedy okay and I was like trudging in the desert of Mexico a real desert with iodide purification tablets and a canteen of water whoa following a river because I knew if I followed a river to a certain point and turned around and followed it back I wouldn't be lost and carrying a lot of spiritual paraphernalia my, my my tarot cards, my dream journal, rocks, mm -hmm. special rocks, but no food or water. So Lita, what do you think it is about 21-year-old 21, 21 Zolita? Because if I picture you from Canada to Mexico, that's quite a trek. What do you think it is about 21-year-old Zolita that equipped you with the strength and fearlessness to to explore that that trek a call from inside you know the thing that I learned very early was to become inner directed I learned to look inside for answers I learned that my soul could speak to me if I became quiet I got very involved in Buddhism for about 14 years and did a lot of formal Buddhist sitting and painting Buddhist tankas and studying with Buddhist teachers. So I was very, very inner directed as a person. And I felt like there's a meaning to my life. And so I need to find what is the meaning of my life? What is the purpose of my life? That trek to the desert, while it was scary in the long run because there were real snakes and real scorpions and real bats which it turns out I don't like bats at all in the caves by the river 
it was really a profound experience. And I came out of it with the real sense that the purpose of my life is to facilitate the evolution of humanity through the transformation of consciousness. That is beautiful. And I would imagine after going through a trek like that, you experienced some things that most people would be terrified of, even just being in a cave with bats. I would think that moving forward, that would make a lot of the things that you've been through since seem seem less scary and help you realize that you are bigger than that situation. Yeah, well, that's what climbing the mountain did. Okay. Like in, in my fantasy, you know, I climb to the mountain, God comes down, gives me the Ten Commandments of the New Age. It's a blissful experience. The reality was when I came out of that desert, I was starving and I ate a whole bunch of Mexican sweet bread. So then I was like high on sugar. <laughs> And I took a bus all the way down the center of Mexico to Guatemala, crossed the border into Guatemala. My pack was kind of broken. Mm. And I find this mountain. I go, oh, there it is, the mountain. <laughs> <laughs> and I climb, to the, I climb up this mountain and I get this big gash on my face and insects are lighting on my face. And, you know, I'm just crawling my way to the top of the mountain and the sun goes down and I'm now in the jungle by yourself. And I hear all these like crashings and cries of a great cat. And I'm like, uh, that's a panther or a jaguar. And I'm like, you know, doing bodhisattva vows and the Girl Scout oath and <laughs> a few Hail Marys. But I get to the point where if the Jaguar gets me, it wouldn't be fast. And I pass out from exhaustion. Wow. Yeah. And you woke up the next morning. What did you think when you woke up the next morning? It was a miracle because the sun hit the dew and the entire mountain was a rainbow. Oh. So I woke up in a rainbow. Wow. And it was like, oh my gosh, there's a miracle. I'm alive. That's almost like a spiritual Ten Commandments download, where I would imagine it it showed you things in a in a way that's more beautiful than you could have experienced any other way. Well, I think it was I did achieve that feeling of coming to know God, but it was like going past terror. Mm. It wasn't like glory, it was terror. Mm. And after terror, the surrender of letting go and letting God, it was a very profound experience. I want everyone who's listening to really think about what Zolita just said, because she said that she found God through, through terror. And there's so many of us who have experienced our own form of terror, our own dark night with the panther growling in the, in the background. And I just want to ask you, you know, what if you are moving through that that point because you're going to find the answer on the other side whatever it is that you've been searching for is on the other side of that terror so thank you Zolita yeah I think that's definitely true when when I was sitting at your kitchen table the other day you or your dining room table whatever it was uh you I am pretty sure that you talked about a mountain trek that you've had more recently can you tell us about about that one after my husband died. This was not the husband I left in Canada. But after my husband died, that I was really, really connected to for 30 years, I really felt I had a broken heart. And so I decided to go to Machu Picchu to mend my heart. And I had this like idea that I was going to sit in Machu Picchu and watch the sun come through the sun gate and New Year's Day, and my heart would begin to heal. Mm -hmm. This was where I learned the lesson that willpower is not enough. Like you say, I'm kind of small, and I'm on this tour with people that are half my age and extreme athletes. They like scale up and down mountains. You know, before the trek even began, they they actually uh, 
spent the night in these glass glass containers that were off the side of a mountain that they scaled up to. And I thought, oh my God, these are my hiking partners. So I really had to like trudge along. And one of the things we had to end up doing was climbing a mountain that was 15,800 feet high oh. of a path that would never be considered a path in Colorado. And it are you was, doing this at, at 76? Is that about? Yes. Oh, okay. Go on. <laughs> yes. Yes. But, but I tend to live my life younger than my biological age because I've got really good genes. My mother's 102 and she's still alive and clear headed. Beautiful. So I'm going to live long. So I'm climbing up this mountain and I slip and I break my kneecap. And I have to end up hiking on my broken kneecap, just browned up because the weather was so bad that a helicopter couldn't have come in and rescued me. It was like raining, sleeting, fog. And so when I went to start down the mountain, I collapsed and had to be carried down by Sherpas. Amazing. It was a little embarrassing, <laughs> but it ended up that, you know, the guide that met me ended up taking me to Machu Picchu on a train, helping me get into the back door of the area so I didn't have to get in with all the crowds of people. And I got to sit in a place where I watched the sun come through the through the stone gate. And it was very moving, it felt very profound. Oh, that is so beautiful. Do you have a sense that that experience did start to spark a healing journey for you and your... Okay. Yes, definitely. Definitely. Because I could then find joy in my grandchildren. Mm you know, and joy and things in life. Like when my darling husband died, I lost my capacity to feel joy. I leaned in too much. I did all of the hospice work in my home with my daughter and my son, and it was very intense. But my husband had a beautiful death. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. I would think that even just having that gift of being able to find joy in their presence again is, is a profound, profound gift. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. It was all worth it. Wow. I think my experiences of life have been worth it. Oh, that's it beautiful. really brought me to the place that I am today and I'm comfortable with who I am. I love that. And being able to look back and it, you know, you've had some experiences that were more intense than probably most of us will ever have in our life to, to be able to look back and realize that it's all worth it and that it made you who you are today. And even if I just think of that magical quality of walking into your home and feeling, feeling that magic, I, I sense that that's something that's been with you since the beginning, but is probably magnified and intensified and you could have shut off or, or hidden, but it's something that you've allowed to shine. And it's just a really beautiful thing. Yes. Okay. I feel like I have a lot more to do in life. You know, I, I plan on being active in life for probably 40 years. I love that. So I, I practice really extreme self-care. Okay. Can you, can you talk a little bit about more about that just for anyone else who's listening and perhaps isn't thriving in that area? Talk to us a little bit more about what you do for self-care. Okay. I think that our ability to live long lives in which our health span matches our lifespan are dependent on how we eat, how we move, how we hydrate, how we sleep, what is our basic mental attitude. Those are all things we can manage. And I find that there are wonderful tools. I do cranial sacral work. I do massage, I have facials, I get acupuncture, I get reflexology, I do Pilates three times a week, and I'm waiting till I get a little stronger, and then I'm definitely going to get back into yoga. It sparks curiosity for me, and so for anyone who might be listening, are you comfortable telling us a little bit more about how you eat? Because I feel like there are you get so many different opinions and so many different ways of thinking about that. I would love to hear what approach you take. So I'm essentially a pescatarian. Okay. 
who eats very little dairy or wheat. Okay. So I essentially eat primarily plant-based food. I probably eat fish two to three times a week. I eat uh, lots and lots of sauteed vegetables. I like just eggs, which is a plant-based egg thing. I like omelets made out of that with chunky salsa on it. Okay. I would only eat organic cereal because of the pesticides and stuff that are sprayed on stuff. But I eat a seven grains organic cereal that has nuts and raisins in it. Okay. That's beautiful. And I, I would expect that you've probably gone through some trial and error to find what's best for you. And just you having the approach and feeling as if like knowing that you are doing what's best for you probably has a big impact on the, the way that nutrition affects your body and affects your well being. I think definitely. So like one of the little tips I'd definitely like to give to people is never eat when you're angry. Ooh, never eat when you're angry. Okay. As you're putting poisonous toxins into the food. Oh, that's so intriguing. I would imagine that probably applies to other negative states as well. Yeah, but definitely anger. Okay. So what do you have any kind of rituals or anything that you do when you are getting ready to eat to make sure that you're in in the right mind frame? Or do you just tend to, to be a pretty optimistic person? I tend to be a pretty optimistic person, but I do have a life that is filled with rituals. Oh, like I like I start with rituals before I even get out of bed of just basically blessing my day and feeling grateful that my that I'm getting stronger and healthier and feeling more and more confident in guidance and direction of my life. I like to write gratitudes in the morning. I'd like to look at my day plan and really make sure that I'm in tune with my plan. I do take moments with presence. You know, just before I got on this call, I was doing some meditations from my spiritual teacher, Chloe Cousins in Manchester, England. And I... I take those those little breaks to get in alignment with source during the day. I have rituals in the evening. I always make sure the last 30 minutes before I go to bed, I listen to Mozart because it opens the higher chambers of the brain and you're more likely to be able to have more interesting dreams. Wow. I love that that tip is worth this whole podcast. I love that. And I would imagine these are all probably things that you have added throughout time, like a piece here and a piece there. Uh, and the reason I want to hear about that is because I think some people, if they're like me, it's like you want to add all these things at once. And so if you want to just talk a little bit about how you've incorporated those into your life. So the best way to build good habits is to, first of all, recognize their importance and secondly, attach them to current habits. Mm. So if you have the current habit of flossing your teeth, you can attach to that habit maybe two minutes of standing deep breathing. If you have the current habit of pouring yourself a cup of coffee, you can attach to it the habit of pausing, coming present, and mentally rehearsing your day. Another thing I think is like really important, and this is something that many people feel uncomfortable with, and it's because of the styles of parenting in the 20th century, but many people are challenged with self-discipline. Okay. And self-discipline is actually one of the most important superpowers to develop because people can have all kinds of talents, but if they cannot discipline them in a way to make them be able to be productive in terms of structure, then they can't really achieve anything. 
I've had many adventures in my life. And one of my adventures was when I came back from Vietnam, I actually, I mean, not Vietnam, from Canada, where I went to because of Vietnam, mm -hmm. the United States was in a different political place. Jimmy Carter was president. It was the bicentennial year, and I ended up joining the Army. And the Army taught me incredible discipline. The Army basically structures your day every 15 minutes. Oh, wow. Now, you could have the same activity that lasted four blocks of 15 minutes, but everything is structured in 15-minute increments. And it taught me to claim time mm. rather than to allow time to get away from you. Do you still kind of like, has some of that carried over into your life now where maybe it might not be 15 minute increments, but, but you, you've adopted some of those teachings into your life now? I think definitely so. You know, one of the things that I learned in the army was that you can accept an authority principle. And if you accept an authority principle, that you don't need to question the dictates of the authority as long as they don't call you to violate personal values. The Army taught you that by making you march through mud, polish your boots and brass, march through mud, polish your boots and brass, you know, so you kind of learned, okay, so this is the authority figure's dime and that's what they want you to do. This is what you do. I would have been able to transfer that into my life by making a list of to-do things, blocking out time to do them, going through my creative ritual. And this is really interesting because I'm sure your therapist self will understand it. I usually have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and a cup of warm milk. And then I listen to Mozart and create for three or four hours. Oh, wow. Is it all right if I unpack that word create? What, what sorts of things happen when you're creating as you're listening to Mozart? I can create content. Okay. Like Saturday, I wrote 21 emails. 21 email newsletters because I have a new email platform and I have a new VA that knows how to operate this platform because it eventually I want to do a lot of things that the platform offers. It's a platform out of Europe. It's not usually just for email, but I'm using it for email to begin with. And so I wrote these emails and gave him instructions to send them out three times one week, two times the next, three times one, two times the next until he runs out. <laughs> Zolita, I, something you said a moment ago stood out to me and I would love to come back, circle back to the idea of parenting in the 21st century and the way that people are parenting today doesn't necessarily instill self, self-discipline into people's lives. If you had an audience with a group of parents and you knew you could guide them in a way that would just be transformational for, for their kids, for their future, how would you, what, what advice would you give to parents about how to so, raise kids? So become familiar with the work of a man named Stephen Glenn, and he was an educational psychiatrist, psychologist in the 20th century in California. Okay. And wrote a book called Raising Self-Reliant Children in a Self-Indulgent World. So I think the main thing is that it's the job of the parent to instill socialization skills. And many, many times parents do not know how to do that effectively because they were not effectively taught and guided themselves. You know, families in America According to Virginia Satir, who I think is to the world of 20th century Western psychology, what Albert Einstein is to physics, Virginia Satir said I mean, most 92% of American families were dysfunctional by 1975. Dysfunctional families can't teach skills. 
They can't teach the skill of personal management of your emotions and how to get you to self to do things. They can't teach you how to be a friend. They can't teach you how to pick appropriate partners. They can't teach you how to become adaptable in the circumstances of life. They can't teach you how to make your decisions and choices based on values and goals, not moods and circumstances. Wow. And so most people that are parents today were not effectively parented. You know, many, many people go through therapy. Unfortunately, we have a tendency to make mental health more about identifying what's wrong rather than focusing on building strengths which is why I left it and became a coach. So we can make the world better. And we make the world better through consciousness. And there is the ripple effect. And as you grow and develop, then the world around you grows and develop. And that's what the power of my new program is going to be. It's the breakthrough to your own brilliance. Wow. It's the breakthrough to the genius inside of you. When does that program become available? Because I, I'm just asking for my own personal self because I'm definitely going to participate. So the program is going to become available probably towards the end of April. So Lita, this has been so beautiful. And I want you to know that you, you are actually my very first podcast guest. So I had a podcast in the past called Silence the Imposter Monster. And this is a brand new podcast and I've been contemplating what to call it. And a colleague suggested that I call it making life magical. And I've just been going back and forth thinking, should I, should I not? And as I was speaking with you, I thought that's, that, that sums it up perfectly. Thank you so much. And just keep posted, keep in touch with me or Zolita. If you want to find out about her book and her program as it becomes available, I think I cut you off. I'll be quiet so you can say whatever you were about to say. No, I just want to wish everyone the very best in their life. And always remember, change your mind and you'll change your life. Thank you so much. Thank you for giving us so many tools and so much inspiration to do that. And I will talk to you soon. Thank you, Zolita. Thank you for listening, my friend. I have a gift for you too. If you've been struggling to make a tough decision, or if you know you want to get to a certain goal, but you have no idea where to start to get there, you can download my free Answer Room Hypnosis Audio by going to lorianswers.com. That's L-O-R-I answers.com. You'll be relieved to know that you will not only get the answer you seek, but you'll become infused with everything you need to follow through with a clear path in front of you. It works even if you're skeptical about hypnosis or if you're super analytical. Again, go to lorianswers.com. That's L-O-R-I answers.com to get free instant access to this life-changing hypnosis protocol. One more time. LoriAnswers.com